Welcome to Common Home Conversations Beyond UN75, a series by the Planetary Podcast. In Common Home Conversations, you will hear from leading global experts on how the proposal of recognizing the existence of an intangible global common without borders can change our relationship with our planet. The Common Home of Humanity has proposed an ambitious new global pact for the environment. The adverse effects of climate change span across borders and beyond territories. Recognizing the Earth system as a common heritage of humankind is the first step in restoring a stable climate, a visible manifestation of a well-functioning Earth system. This proposal's cascading effects would be systemic and tremendously impact international relations and economics, opening the doors to restoring a well-functioning Earth system. Common Home Conversations is the place to discuss a new social contract between society, economy, and the Earth system. Now, here is your host, founder and CEO of the Planetary Press, Kimberly White. Hello and welcome to Common Home Conversations. Today we are joined by Paulo Megalej, founder and president of the Common Home of Humanity. Thank you for joining us today, Paulo. Thank you. Thank you so much for your invitation. So kind. Thank you. So, Paulo, can you tell us what inspired you and your organization to launch this global call for a legal framework? Uh, the main idea, the, the, the starting point was when I saw a legal dysfunction, uh, one incapacity for law to explain the world. And this, this happened uh, on 2002. Uh, when the uh, oil tank, uh, oil tanker uh, that uh, crashed near the border between Portugal and Spain, in the north of Portugal, and the, the crash was on Spanish waters, and the first reaction of the Spanish authorities was to push the boat for Portuguese waters. They tried to push, and after our army uh, sent the boats and. Uh, the reality was that there were several boats on the water in the middle of the, the oil split and the oil go to both sides. This is when this reality of having uh, one line that is abstract, that is a legal abstraction, that divide them, the sea, the sea, we cannot divide the sea, we, cannot, we can divide the space of the sea but we cannot divide the water. We cannot divide the system. We cannot divide the quality of the water or the fishes. So this is really one incapacity of law to explain the reality of this planet, of this interconnected planet. For so, uh, when we do lose the connection between the abstraction and the legal figuration and the reality of the planet, we have to look for solutions. This is what you need, a new legal abstraction that is able to represent the interconnections of the planet. So we have had agreements to address the climate crisis, such as the Kyoto Protocol and, of course, the Paris Climate Accord. However, we're still struggling to move the needle. The annual emissions gap report from the UN Environment released last year found that global greenhouse gas emissions must fall by more than 7% each year over the next decade if we're to limit warming to 1.5 degrees. And we recently learned that we have failed to achieve any of the global biodiversity targets set a decade ago. What do you believe has prevented us from moving forward and finding a solution? One of the main mistakes is to consider an our mental inability to address the global. You understand? To, to accept, we can say, but to accept and to deal that the things are all interconnected. The question is the same problem that I talked before about the, the absence of one legal abstraction that is able to represent the interconnects, the interdependence of this planet is the same reason or is the structural reason for not achieving any result, in my view, on the climate emergency or biodiversity. The question is, when climate, for the first time, entered on the UN discussions in the 80s, the first question that was raised was, what is climate from a legal point of view? Climate, as you can imagine, 
is something absolutely different for international law because climate is not a territory, is a system, is a, more than a system, is a, a well functioning system, is a pattern of stability of the function of this system that is pre predictable that we can have seasons, well defined seasons. Yeah. And all the years, the same pattern repeats and repeats again. And we have an envelope of temperatures that stay inside these limits of temperature. Climate is, for so it's a well function, a well function earth system is a way of function of the system that is favorable for humans and other species. And this mode, operating mode of the system is intangible, is a software. It's not a territory, it's not the hardware, it's the software. The great question is that from a legal point of view, we still look at the planet as we did in the, in the 18th century, in the 17th century, in the 16th century or more. The question is, we still looking this planet only as a territory divided between states where the leftovers of the territories are the global commons. And this is not true. This is not absolutely true. What makes this planet different from all the planets that we know is the system. All the planets have a territory, bigger or smaller than Earth. All the planets have a territory. What the other planets do not have, and we have here in this planet, is the system that supports life. The system, the system in a well-functioned way of function, is our main heritage. Is our main and most valued thing that we have on Earth because support life and support us. And for the law, this system does not exist. Does not exist because it's intangible, because we cannot divide it, because we cannot appropriate it, we cannot privatize these things. And if we can divide the space of the sea, as we have made on the territorial waters, we can divide the space, but we cannot divide the system that operate inside the water of the oceans. We cannot divide the system that operate on the airspace. We can divide space. We cannot divide the system. Okay, and this is the great difference, because we do not accept that we have a global common without borders. We do not manage climate as a global common. This is the great question. When climate entered on in the UN negotiations in the eighties, the first proposal from Malta was to propose to recognize a stable climate as a common heritage of mankind. The question was in 1992, in, in Rio summit, the decision was to consider climate change as a common concern of, of mankind. And this makes all the difference. This is the main reason why we still do not have any results in tackling, tackling with climate change. Because with this decision, we decide that climate is not a common good. We decide that climate is a issue, a issue like any, any issue. And from a legal point of view, no one knows what is a concern from a legal point of view in terms of rights and, and in terms of duties. And the main question, because we do not accept that climate is a system that exists in the real world and not a issue, we do not accept that it is a global common and we do not manage it as a global common. And the great question is, again, because we do not, do not recognize the stable climate as a global public good, all the benefits that maintain and produce a stable climate do not exist for the law and for so do not exist for economy. For example, the question of Amazon. We, I call it the paradox of Amazon. Everyone knows that the forest of Amazon is one of the key ecosystems on the planet that maintain and produce a stable climate. 
this forest has the highest value for humanity? The great question is this value that everyone feels that this value, everyone knows about this value, but this value is not visible for economy. Why? Because when we talk about the value of, of, of Amazon, we are talking about the intangible work that these ecosystems and other ecosystems around the world make on the function, on the mode of operating of the earth system, on the intangible work of nature, on the chemical changes that the forest made on, on the air, on the water, on the soil. And these chemical changes, this intangible work does not exist because the common does not exist. From a legal point of view, this work is made in a global legal gap. The global does not exist. Law considered global commons are only the leftovers of the territories. Sorry. Sorry. This planet is more than a territory. No jurist in the world, no legal expert in the world can say that that is not true. The truth is that this planet is more than a territory. And nature is not wrong. What is wrong is the law. The law is wrong. Without changing this, it will be totally impossible to restore the system because we do not have a legal framework to restore a global common. No one will make improvements on a global common that does not exist, that will not be compensated for this. No, no one will produce benefits on a legal gap. This is the great question. And the result of the concern approach is not a decision to manage a global common that implies a congruence, a congruence between the rules of appropriation of the global common and also a congruence uh, from appropriation with the providing the global public rules. We need rules for providing, providing the global public rules and for appropriation. The result, because we do not have the global common, the result is one system of mitigation between states. And the system of mitigation is we will try to make less emissions, but in the end, this is a, ne a negative sum game. We will continue to make uh, emissions, and this is the only way our economy works. Because to make positive, to make benefits on that system, to restore that system, it's invisible for economy. Without changing this leg of framework, we will not restore that system. We will not assure the future for next generation. Now, when discussing an intangible global common without borders, one initial misconception regarding this deals with national borders and sovereignty. Can you address this? We must understand, some way explain, that these are diff two different realities. One is the division of the space. Another is the system. Two different realities. And this is the great secret, somehow, for the condominium. Why in the condominium it's possible to have common property inside the space of private property? Because they are different things. One, is, one thing is the space, is my apartment. Another thing is the, the system of electricity or the system of water, okay? Or the system of the elevators. These are, one is a functional division, another is a space division. And we can conciliate both. This is what we need to do in the planet. We need to consider the system as a global common that exists inside and outside all the sovereignties. And this do not mean that we have to, to finish with the borders, with the sovereignties. To be honest, the only way to keep sovereignty under the territories is to keep the system in a well-functioned way. Without a well-functioned earth system, there is no sovereignty that can say, I do not agree with climate change. The climate change is there. The system is there. This is the reality of this planet. And this is not under the, the sovereignty of any state. This is not under the jurisdiction of any state. 
the only way to manage one common is, as, as uh, Professor Eleanor Austin tells us, the first step is to define the common. What is the common that is a stake we have to manage? And this is the first step. And I think is to define that system as a common heritage on, of mankind. And now we have the scientific tools that are needed to define this common heritage. The safe, op- the safe operating space for humankind, I think, is the scientific tool to define this intangible common heritage of mankind that support life. The second s- step is to create congruence between the rules for appropriation and the rules for provision of the common good. Without this, it's impossible to have a collective action. This is the structural conditions for a collective action. Climate change is not a problem of CO2. Climate change, before being a problem of CO2 or economic problem, is a problem of commons, of managing commons. Without creating the conditions to be possible, a successful management of a common, we will not address, we will not win this war against climate change. Because this is a problem that no one's talk about, that is behind all the problems, and people consider, take as, as something given that climate change is a common concern with or however without no one knows what is a concern. So climate change is essentially a symptom, not the root cause of the illness. It's a symptom yeah yeah, you are right. It is the difficulty of accepting from a sovereignty feeling that we have a common inside our territory. Independently if you accept or not, the comment is there is function, we, we have no sovereignty under the common, the common system, and our future, the future of the next generations, depend on this common. Now, historically, economic growth has come at a devastating cost to the Earth's natural systems or global commons. Essentially, when we destroy the environment, we create wealth with no penalty, but at the same time, there are no incentives in place to reward nature-positive solutions. And recent studies have found that nature could create trillions of dollars in annual business opportunities. The system is dysfunctional. How do we reconcile economic development with growing environmental concerns? And this is, again, a legal question. A legal question that is behind the conception of value, the conception of what is wealth creation in our society. If we accept that we have a common without borders, intangible, that is not a threat to the sovereignties. That is the only way to keep the sovereignties working for the future and driving for the future. If we accept this and we accept that the climate that I have inside my country depends on what uh, others made on the other side of the planet, depends on the ecosystems that are in other countries. If we accept this common, we put some competencies in one institution that will manage, that I think should be United Nations, that should manage what are the positive impacts that each one make and the the negative impacts that each one make on the common system to create a system of accountancy of these impacts to create global public policy of the maintenance of this this climate. We can change the rule of the game where the wealth creation, the wealth creation in our society only happens if we destroy nature. If we recognize the commons, we can give value to the work of nature. We can give value to the intangible work of nature. And we must distinguish that Amazon, the, the rainforest, I only talk of, about Amazon because it's the biggest, okay? All the, the ecosystems are, the, this is the same thinking for the, the rest of the ecosystems, but I talk about Amazon because it's the biggest one. The lungs of the earth. Yeah. The question is, the forest of Amazon belongs to the nine countries that share this space on earth. 
The work that is made there is common because there is no borders for the work of nature. There is no borders for the evapotranspiration. There is no borders for the, absor the absorption of CO2. There is no borders for the oxygen. There is no borders for the, the organic that goes to the water that after uh, all the uh, mat uh, organic material that goes to the water and after feeds all the oceans. There is no borders for this. But these forests, it belongs to the countries that are there. The question is, we need to make one accountancy of system that compensates this work for the benefits that these territories made to all the system that we all share the benefits. We all share the benefits of these ecosystems in the same way that we all share the damage that the pollution or the emissions of, of fuels all over the, play, the place. We share the benefits and we share the damage. So the only way to harmonize this question is to recognize the common and after to make a system of governance of the use of this common. And to think, if we accept the benefits, see if we introduce the benefits on the accountancy, all the accountancy will change. It will have cascade effects on the emissions, on the logic of the emissions, on the logic of what is, what enter on the GDP of countries. Without changing this rule, we will continue on the negative sum, sum game. We will try to reduce emissions, but we will never restore the, the system. Because we will, we will not create one caring activity of that system in the countries. And the caring activity of that system should be compensated and should enter, should become visible on the GDP of, of the countries. And we must have a, a balance between the positive impacts and the negative impacts. And the question is, if we introduce the positive impacts, what will be the consequences, the cascade consequences on the negative? Because this will change the rule of the game, is to touch in one initial condition of the system that will have cascading effects, that will have domino effects in all the economy, in all the relations between North and South, in all the relations inside the countries, the, it's a paradigm shift. And to have results, I think it's inevitably that we need a paradigm shift. We have so, so many paradigm shifts along the history. Why we cannot have another one? And think on this. We have already recognized the existence of, we have a legal status for the common heritage of mankind. We have already recognized legal objects of law, intangible legal of objects of law in outer space law. We have already defined the safe operating space, that is this space, when we are talking about the safe operating space with the planet boundary framework, we are not talking a space. This space is not a territorial space. It's a quality space of the system. We have the quantity and quality parameters that define a well-functioned system. We have all the tools that we need to recognize a global common, to measure the impacts, to define the global common, to change. The only obstacle that we have in our heads, in our ideas, is to accept that we have a global common without borders. This is the only obstacle we have. The obstacle between to give the opportunity for next generations to drive and to live or to be in the, in the disruption, in the climate disruption, the only obstacle in this moment is one long-held belief that we have borders and we do not have a global common without borders. The great question is we are not talking about territories. We have to live our mindsets from the territory and to embrace the idea of the system. We need 
to keep the borders on the territories, to have peace, to maintain the peace that we can get, but at the same time, we need to build a legal framework that is able to represent the global function of the earth system. We need something, a legal abstraction, that is not earth system. When we propose to recognize earth system as a common heritage, is not saying that the common heritage will be their system. This, this will be a representation of their system with the knowledge that we have now, that is the safe operating space, that is the best knowledge that we, we have now. The reality is what we can have for sure is that this planet is not only a territory and we need to represent the functionality of the system from a legal point of view and after to build a system of global governance of this global common. So by introducing in our accountancy, in our GDP, the work of nature, we can make a paradigm shift in what is value. And by doing so, we, we can build one economy not only to reduce emissions, that we are already starting to do it, but also one economy of restoring the Earth system. Okay? The countries that have huge ecosystems, the key ecosystems of, of, of the planet, of course, they must be compensated. Okay? But they must be compensated because they are providing one services that support life for everyone. And this would create new jobs, new ways of well creation. And you, you know, you have to work on both sides, reducing the impact and restoring the ecosystems. And they will work together. But to work together and to work on both sides, you need that the, the results, the outcome of this work, the outcomes of this activity become visible in the economic system, in the global economic system. And do not forget, when you are investing in less emissions, in equipments with less emissions, with or capturing CO2, you are working on intangibles, natural intangibles. You are producing benefits on that system, or less emissions, or negative, or capturing CO2. So you, we are always working when we are reducing with best, uh, with new technologies to, to, to avoid emissions. We are leading with int natural intangibles. We are leading to avoid emissions of natural intangibles. So what we are talking about is uh, about one economy of natural intangibles, uh, more than commodities that are support of life. And we should build uh, this new economy around this. So it's a new economy that will have new jobs, uh, new uh, economic activities that are different from the previous one. Okay, so there is no a contradiction between economy and nature. The contradiction is between what we conceive as value, what we consider as wealth creation, and nature. Economy is not in opposition to nature. What is in opposition is our concept of what is value for nature, what is value for economy, what is the concept of wealth creation. Now, I think that's a really great point. And I know that the World Economic Forum recently came out with a report on how nature-positive solutions are good for our economy. So essentially, shifting away from business as usual, which is a hot topic right now with COVID-19 and the green recovery, and adopting these nature-positive solutions could create trillions of dollars in annual business opportunities and create nearly 400 million jobs over the next 10 years alone. So this will be very beneficial for us as a global community and also our local communities. Yes, with, with some great, great advantage, Kimberly. Very good technologies uh, with zero emissions or 
capturing CO2 with no damage or nature-based solutions. To boost the programs of nature-based solutions, you need a Lego framework that capture what today are positive externalities. Okay, to have money to invest in nature-based solutions. Okay, no one will put millions and millions and millions of dollars in nature-based solutions because the outcomes of nature-based solutions are inter- natural intangibles, benefits on that system that, that need to be compensated. Okay, so to talk about one conflict between economy and, uh, and nature is absolutely madness in the sense that the problem is not economy, the problem is what is value. And I ask again, what is value for humankind? More iPods or more communities or more the biogeophysical conditions that support life? We can never, also, we can continue to produce communities. We need to produce communities, but we need to produce less communities and to produce more intangible, natural intangibles that support life. Because without this, in the end, no one will earn money because the system will collapse. So the problem is the system of what is, what has value for us? What really matters for us? Okay. This is the question. We give value to what? And the value is invented for us, but the system do not change. The only one that can change is economy. The only that can change is the law. The, the laws of nature will not change. So the only solution is to adapt our laws, to adapt our economy to what supports life. And the next generations there is no excuse to do not do it. There is no excuse. I like that. We must change because the laws of nature will not change. Thank you, Paulo. This was enlightening. Do you have any final thoughts to share with our audience? We can manage the system without undermining the territory, the sovereignty of states. This is, from a legal point of view, from a political point of view, one huge revolution. Because this is the time also to connect the new science about the function of that system, the unity of that system, with the concepts, with the legal concepts, with the political solutions, with the designing of policies and the designing of organic institutions, of institutions designing global governance. So, only connecting all of, all of this science with law, with the consequences in the economy, by recognizing the work of nature that supports life, and also connecting with the political and institutional solutions that we need to manage the system, this is the new society that we need, the evolution that we need to have one anthropocene where we can live, where the next generations can live. We cannot think that in the anthropocene we will live on the same way with the same thoughts that we live 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 5 years ago. And do not forget also all the isms that we are seeing now the nationalists and so on are also one outcome of not having solution for this fact of being. We are all connect. We will depend on each other in a global scale. And because we have no solutions for this, we have no design, we have no governance design for this reality of the planet. The, the outcome is each one is trying to close themselves in their borders, thinking that this is the best solution for them. And we know that this, this is not true. Climate change, pandemics, do not respect any border. For so, only building something that represents a world without borders, the systemic approach, and keeping the borders on the territory and allowing 
the system to exist without borders, we can find new solutions. All right, and there you have it. Our planet is more than a territory, and the great quest moving forward is to recognize the existence of the Earth system as a common heritage of humankind. By recognizing our global commons, we can give value to the intangible work of nature and take the first step to restoring a stable climate, a visible manifestation of a well-functioning Earth system. That is all for today, and thank you for joining us for this episode of Common Home Conversations Beyond UN75. Please subscribe, share, and be sure to tune in next Wednesday to continue the conversation with our special guest, Carl Burkhart, co-founder and managing director of One Earth. And visit us at www.theplanetarypress.com for more episodes and the latest news in sustainability, climate change, and the environment.